Good afternoon, everybody. I am Charlotte, and this is Quarantine Storytime. And I'm just trying to figure out a good way to balance everything as we... But isn't that the norm of life, trying to balance everything? So, as you may have seen from the quick preview that I just shot, we are now in the epilogue of the book. Yay! Which means we're really near the end, which means it's basically over. Um, that being said, it's a long epilogue. So... Because of the way Tolstoy broke it up, he actually broke the epilogue up, up into sections and parts. Um, we're actually going to do lo slightly longer reads this week um, to finish out, but I think we should have it finished by Thursday. So that's the good news. Um, so we'll do half of part one today and then half tomorrow and then half of part two on Wednesday and then the other half of it and um there's like an appendix note a uh, letter from tolstoy that he wrote that should just all fit in at, on thursday and we can we'll be done by thursday which is very exciting and then on we'll have friday off and i think we'll probably i'll probably take a week off after that um before we go jump into any more readings but and we can you know take the time to find a good book that we want to all want to read or something like that. Um, so yeah, we should be done by Thursday this week and then taking some time off after that before we jump into another uh, book reading together. Um, I hope everybody had a great weekend. <sighs> I know I did. It was outside a little bit, got a little sun, uh, climbed a tree, got a little scraped up, you know, it happens. Um, so yeah, if you guys recall from last week, Pierre and Natasha um, ha are going well. They're they're not engaged even, but there's just sort of an understanding that um, they are going to be romantically attached to each other sometime in the future. And pretty much Tolstoy ends the book with just like, and then they're, you know, they're kind of in love with each other and something good will happen there. And hopefully Princess Mario will marry Nikolai as well. It's like, but we don't hear about Sonia. We don't hear about like any of the other stuff about the Rostovs or any of the other characters. Um, and there's no really like definitiveness at where we ended uh, volume four last week about like what's happening with anybody. We're just kind of like, yeah. Pierre likes her and she likes him and that'll work out for these crazy kids. So I'm looking forward to the epilogue because I hope he will add a little bit more definitive like closure to um, what's happening with all our crazy, all of our favorite characters. So let's, uh, like I said, it'll be a little bit of a longer read today because of the way the epilogue is spaced out. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, as you recall, when we ended, it was like the end of the year 1812 and Napoleon had, you know, was fleeing Russia and yeah, 1812 going into 1813. <sighs> All right. So this is the epilogue part one, um, section one, and we'll read section one through nine, which is about halfway through. So let's go. Section one. <clears throat> Seven years had passed since 1812. The churned-up historical sea of Europe settled back in within its shores. It seemed to have grown still, but the mysterious forces that move mankind, mysterious because the laws that determine their movement are unknown to us, continued their actions. Though the surface of the historical sea seemed immobile, mankind moved on as ceaselessly as the movement of time. Various groups of human connections were made and unmade, Causes were prepared for the formation and decomposition of states, for the displacements of peoples. The historical sea did not, as formerly, direct its surges from one shore to another. It seethed in its depths. Historical figures were not, as formerly, borne by the waves from one shore to another. They now seemed to turn in place. Historical figures, who formerly, at the head of armies, reflected the movement of the masses by ordering wars, marches, battles, now reflected the seething movement with through political and diplomatic considerations, laws, treatises. Historians call this activity of historical figures the reaction. Describing the activity of these historical figures who were, in their opinion, the cause of what they call the reaction, historians severely condemn them. 
all the well-known people of that time, from Alexander and Napoleon to Madame de Stael, Fotis, Schelling, Fichte, Chateaubriand, and others, pass before their severe judgment and are either acquitted or condemned, depending on whether they contributed to progress or the reaction. In Russia, according to their descriptions, a reaction was also going on in the period of that time, and the chief perpetrator of this reaction was Alexander I. The same Alexander I, who, according to their own descriptions, was the chief perpetrator of the liberal initiatives of his reign and of the salvation of Russia. In present-day Russian literature, from the schoolboy to the learned historian, there is not one person who does not cast his little stone at Alexander I for his wrong actions during the period of his reign. He should have acted thus and so. In this case, he acted well and that badly. He behaved himself splendidly at the beginning of his reign and during the year 12, but he acted badly in granting Poland a constitution, forming the Holy Alliance, giving power to Arikchiv, encouraging Golitsyn and mysticism, and then encouraging Shits. Shishkov and Photius. He did badly in occupying himself with the front-line units of the army. He acted badly in disbanding the Semyonovsky regiment, and so on. One would have to fill ten pages with writing in order to enumerate all the, that the historians reproach him with, on the basis of that knowledge of the good of mankind which they possess. What did these reproaches mean? The very actions for which the, the historians approve of Alexander I, such as the liberal initiatives of the reign, the struggle with Napoleon, the firmness he showed in the year 12, and the campaign of the year 13. Do they not all come from the same sources, from the conditions of blood, upbringing, life that made the person of Alexander who he was, and from which also come the actions for which the historians blame him, such as the Holy Alliance, the restoration of Poland, the reaction of the 20s? In what consists the essence of these reproaches? It is that a historical figure, such as Alexander I, a figure who stood on the highest possible step of human power, as if at the focal point of the blinding light of all the historical rays concentrated upon him, a figure subject to the strongest influences in the world of intrigues, deceptions, flattery, self-delusion, which are inseparable from power. A figure who felt upon himself at every moment of his life the responsibility for all that was happening in Europe, and not an invented figure, but a living one, and like every man with his personal habits, passions, striving for goodness, beauty, truth, that this figure, 50 years ago, was not so, mu so much not virtuous, the historians do not reproach him for that, but did not have those views of the good of mankind now possessed by a professor who from his youth have been taken up with learning, that is, reading books, attending lectures, and copying things from these books and lectures into a notebook. But even if we suppose that Alexander I was mistaken 50 years ago in his views of what the good of the peoples was, we must involuntarily suppose that the historian judging Alexander will, in the same way, after the passing of some time, turn out to be incorrect in his view of what the good of mankind is. This supposition is the more natural and ne necessary in that, as we follow the development of historical science, we see that the view of what the good of mankind is changes with each new year, with each new writer, so that in ten years what seemed good looks like evil and vice versa. What is more in one and the same time, we find completely opposite views among historians as to what was evil and what was good. Some set the Holy Alliance and the granting of a constitution to Poland to the credit others to the reproach of Alexander. Of the activity of Alexander and Napoleon, it is impossible to say that it was harmful or useful, for we cannot say what it was useful or harmful for. If that activity displeases someone, it displeases him only because it does not coincide with his limited notion of what the good is. The preservation of my father's house in Moscow in the year 12, or the glory of the Russian army, or the flourishing of the universities in Petersburg and elsewhere, or the freedom of Poland, or the might of Russia or the balance of power of Europe, or of a certain sort of European enlightenment known as progress, may seem good to me, but I must acknowledge that besides these purposes, the activity of every historical figure had other more general purposes, inaccessible to me. But let us suppose that so-called science has the possibility of reconciling all contradictions and possesses all an immutable yardstick for good and evil for historical figures and events. Let us suppose that Alexander could have done everything otherwise. Let us suppose that according to the prescription of those who accuse him, those who profess a knowledge of the ultimate purpose of mankind's movement, he could have arranged everything according to 
the program of nationhood, freedom, equality, and progress, there seems to be no other, which his present-day accusers would have provided for him. Let us suppose that this program was possible and drawn up, and that Alexander acted according to it. What would have been become, then, of the activity of all of those people who opposed that the then tendency of the government, an activity which in, op in the opinion of historians was good and useful. There would have been no such activity. There would have been no life. There would have been nothing. If we allow that human life can be governed by reason, the possibility of life is annihilated. Section 2. If we allow, as historians do, that great men lead mankind to the achievement of certain purposes, which consist either in the greatness of Russia or France or in the balance of Europe, or in spreading the ideas of the revolution or in general purposes or in whatever else, then it is impossible to explain the phenomena of history without the notion, notions of chance and genius. If the purpose of the European wars at the beginning of the present century was the greatness of Russia, that the purpose could have been achieved without any of the preceding wars without any and without the invasion. If the purpose was the greatness of France, it could have been achieved without the revolution and without the empire. If the purpose was the spreading of ideas, printing would have carried it out far better than soldiers. If the purpose was the progress of civilization, it's quite easy to suppose that, besides the destruction of people and their wealth, there are other more expedient ways to spread civilization. Why did it happen this way and not otherwise? Because this is how it happened. Chance made the situation. Genius profited from it, says history. But what is chance? And what is genius? The words chance and genius do not designate anything that actually exists and therefore cannot be defined. These words designate only a certain degree of understanding of phenomena. I do not know why such and such a phenomenon occurs. I think that I cannot know it. Therefore, I do not want to know it. And I say chance. I see a power that produces effects incommensurate with hum common human qualities. I do not know why that happens. And I say genius. For a flock of sheep, the sheep that the shepherd takes into a separate pen to be fed and that grows twice as fat as the others must seem a genius. And the circumstance that every evening precisely this same sheep ends up not in the general fold but in a separate pen to have oats and that this precisely this same sheep spilling over with fat is killed for meat for meat must appear as an extraordinary astonishing conjunction of genius with a whole series of extraordinary chances but the sheep need not only stop thinking that everything ha that happens to them occurs only to achieve their sheep purposes they need only allow that what happens to them may have purposes incomprehensible to them, and they will immediately see the unity, the consistency, in what happens to be fattened to a fattened up sheep. Even if they do not know the purpose for which he is being fattened up, they will at least know that all that happened to the sheep did not happen by chance. They will no longer need the notion of chance or of genius. Only by renouncing the knowledge of an immediate income immediate comprehensible purpose and admitting that the final purpose is inaccessible to us will we see that the cons the consistency and expediency in life of historical figures the cause will be revealed to us that effect incommensurate with common human qualities which they produce and we will not need the words chance and genius we need only admit that the purpose of the upheaval of the european peoples is unknown to us, while we know only facts which consist in murders, first in France, then in Italy, in Africa, in Prussia, in Austria, in Spain, in Russia, and that the movements from west to east and from east to west constitute the essence and purpose of these events. And not only will we not need to see anything exceptional and marked by genius in the characters of Napoleon and Alexander, but it will be impossible for us to picture these figures otherwise than as the same people as all the rest. Not only will we no longer need to explain by chance those small events that made these men what they were, but it will be clear that all those small events were necessary. In renouncing knowledge of the final purpose, we will clearly understand that, just as it is impossible to invent for any plant a flower and a seed that correspond to it more than it, those it produces, so it is impossible to invent to other persons with all their past who would correspond to such a degree and such minute detail to the purpose they were meant to fulfill." deep but thoughtful section three 
The fundamental, essential meaning of the European events in the beginning of the present century is the military movement of the masses of European peoples from west to east and then from east to west. The initial movement was from west to east, from the people of the west to be able to perform that military movement to Moscow, which they did perform, it was necessary, one, that they form a military group of such a size as to be able to withstand a clash with the military group of the East, and two, that they renounce all established traditions and customs, and three, that in performing their military movement, they have at their head a man who could justify both himself, both to himself and to them the deceptions, robberies, and murders which were to be performed and were accompanied that movement. And starting with the French Revolution, the old, insufficiently large group is destroyed. Old customs and traditions are obliterated. Step by step, a group of new size is produced, along with new customs and traditions. And that man is prepared who is to stand at the head of the future movement and bear upon himself all the responsibility for what is to be performed. A man without convictions without customs, without traditions, without a name, not even a Frenchman, seemingly, by the strangest chances, moves among all the parties stirring up France, and without attaching himself to any of them, is borne up to a conspicuous place. The ignorance of his associates, the weakness and insignificance of his opponents, the sincerity of his lies, and the brilliant and self-confident limitlessness limitedness, sorry, self-confident limitedness of this man move him to the head of the army. A brilliant compliment of soldiers from the Italian army, the reluctance of his adversaries to fight, his childish boldness and self-confidence win him military glory. Countless numbers of so-called chances accompany him everywhere. The disgrace he falls into with the rulers of France turns to his advantage. His attempts to change the path he is destined for fail. He is not accepted into the Russian service and fails to obtain an appointment in Turkey. During the wars in Italy, several times he is on the brink of destruction and is saved each time in an unexpected way. The Russian troops, the very ones who can destroy his glory, do not, for various diplomatic considerations, enter Europe while he is there. On his return from Italy, he finds the government in Paris in that progress of decomposition in which the people who happen to be in this government are inevitably wiped out and obliterated, and a way out of this dangerous situation appears to him of itself, consisting in a senseless, groundless expedition to Africa. Again, the so-called chances accompany him. Impregnable Malta surrenders without a shot fired. The most imprudent orders are crowned with success. The enemy fleet, which afterwards will not let a single boat pass, lets pass a whole army. In Africa, a whole series of villainies is committed upon the all but unarmed inhabitants. And the people who commit these villainies, and in particular their leader, assure themselves that this is beautiful, that this is glory, that this is like Caesar and Alexander the Great, and that this is good. That ideal of glory and greatness, which consists not only in considering nothing that one does as bad, but in being proud of one's every crime, ascribing some incomprehensible supernatural meaning to it, that ideal, which was to guide this man and the people connected with him, is freely developed in Africa. Everything he does succeeds. The plague leaves him untouched. The cruel murder of prisoners is not imputed to him in fault. His childishly imprudent, groundless, and ignoble departure from Africa, leaving his comrades in trouble, is set to his credit, and again the enemy flees, and the enemy fleet misses him twice. At the time when, already completely intoxicated by the successful crimes he has committed, prepared for his role, he arrives in Paris without any aim. The decomposition of the Republic government, which could have destroyed him a year earlier, has reached the ultimate degree, and his presence, clear of any parties, can now only elevate him. He has no plan at all. He is afraid of everything, but the parties seize upon him and demand his participation. He alone, with his ideal of glory and greatness, worked out in Italy and Egypt, with his insane self-adoration and with his boldness in crime, with his sincerity in lying, he alone can justify what is to be performed. He is needed for the place that awaits him, and therefore, almost independently of his will and despite his irresolution, his lack of a plan, all the mistakes he makes, he is drawn into a conspiracy, the purpose of which is the seizure of power and the conspiracy is crowned with success. Oh my goodness, this sounds way too familiar. He is pushed into a meeting of the rulers. 
Frightened, he wants to flee, considering himself lost. He pretends to faint. He says senseless things, which should have been his ruin. But the rulers of France, once sharp-witted and proud, now sensing that their role has played out, are still more confused than he is, and do not say the words that need to be said in order to hold on to power and destroy him. Chance. Millions of chances give him power, and all people, as if by arrangement, contribute to the strengthening of that power. Chance makes the characters of the then rulers of France submissive to him. Chance makes the character of Paul I, who recognizes his power. Chance makes a conspiracy against him, which not only does not harm him, but strengthens his power. Chance sends de en Enyan into his hand and accidentally forces him to kill him, thereby convincing the mob more forcefully than by any other means that he has the right because he has the power. Chance makes it so that he strains all his forces towards an expedition to England, which obviously would have destroyed him, and never carries out his intentions, but instead unexpectedly runs into Mac and his Austrians, who surrender without a battle. Chance and genius give him the battle at Austerlitz, and by chance all people, not only the French, but all of Europe as well, with the exception of England, which does not participate in the events about to take place, all people recognize or all people, despite their former horror and loathing for his crimes, now recognize his power, the title he has given himself, and his ideal of greatness and glory, which to all of them seems something beautiful and reasonable. As if by trying them as if trying themselves out and preparing for the coming movement, the forces of the West in 1805, 06, 07, and 9 repeatedly push eastward, gaining strength and growing in numbers. In 1811, the group of people formed in France merges into a huge group with the people of the center. Along with the ever-increasing group of people, the power of justification of the man who stands at the head of the movement now develops further. During the 10-year preparatory period preceding the big movement, this man is brought together with all the crowned heads of Europe. The unmasked rulers of the world cannot oppose any intelligent ideal to Napoleon's ideal of glory and greatness, which has no meaning. One after another, they rush to demonstrate their non-entity to him. The king of Prussia sends his wife to seek favor with the great man. The emperor of Austria considers it a favor that this man receives a daughter of the Caesars in his bed. The pope, a guardian of what the peoples hold sacred, lets his religion serve the great man's rise. It is not so much Napoleon himself who prepares for the fulfilling of his role, as everything around him prepares him to take upon himself all responsibility for what is being performed and is to be performed. There is no action, no villainy or petty deception committed by him that is not reflected at once on the lips of those around him in the form of a great deed. The best celebration the Germans can think up for him is to celebrate Jena and Auerstadt. Not only is he great, but his ancestors, his brother, his stepsons, his brothers-in-law are great. Everything is done to deprive him of the last powers of reason and prepare for his, for his terrible role. And when he is ready, the forces are ready as well. The invasion pushes eastward. It reaches its final goal, Moscow. The capital is taken. The Russian army is annihilated more than any enemy armies were ever annihilated in previous wars from Austerlitz to Wagram. But suddenly, instead of the chances and genius that had up till now led him so consistently through an unbroken series of successes to the appointed goal, there appear a countless number of reverse chances. From a head cold at Borodino to the frost and the spark that set fires to Moscow, and instead of genius, there appears an unexampled unexam stupidity and baseness. The invasion flees, returns, flees again, and now all the chances are constantly not but not for but against him. A counter-movement is performed from east to west, which remarkably resembles the preceding movement from west to east. In 1805, 1807, and 1809, the same attempts at movement from east to west precede the big movement. There is the same merging into a group of huge dimensions, the same joining of peoples of the center to the movement, the same hesitation midway, and the same swiftness as they near the goal. Paris, the ultimate goal, is reached, the Napoleonic government and army are destroyed. Napoleon himself no longer has any meaning. All his actions are obviously pathetic and vile, but again an inexplicable chance occurs. The allies hate Napoleon in whom they see the cause of their calamities. Deprived of strength and power, opposed in his villainies and perfidities, he ought to appear to them as he appeared ten years earlier and one year later, as a bandit and outlaw. 
but by some strange chance, no one sees it. His role is not finished yet. The man who 10 years earlier and one year later is considered a bandit and outlaw is sent a two-day sail from France to an island given into his possession with guards and several million which are paid to him for some reason. I love Tolstoy. Section 4. The movement of the peoples begins to settle within its shores. The wave of the big movement flood back and on the calm sea eddies form over which diplomats skim, imagining that it preci is precisely they who brought about the calming of the movement. But the calm sea suddenly rises. To the diplomats, it seems that they, that their disagreements are the cause of this new upsurge of forces and they expect war among the sovereigns. The situation seems insoluble to them, but the wave which they can feel rising does not break where they expect. The same wave rises from the same point of departure, Paris. The last backwash of the movement from the West occurs, the backwash that is to resolve the seemingly unresolvable diplomatic difficulties and put an end to the military movement of that period. The man who devastated France, alone, without conspiracy, without soldiers, comes back to France. Any guard can arrest him, but by a strange chance, not only does no one arrest him, but everyone greets with rapture the man whom they cursed the day before and will curse a month later. This man is still needed to justify the last joint act. The act is performed. The last role has been played. The actor is told to undress and wash off his grease paint and rouge. There is no more need for him. And several years go by, during which this man, in solitude on his island, plays a pathetic comedy before himself, pettily intriguing and lying to justify his actions, when that justification is no longer needed, and showing to the whole world what it it was that people took for strength while an unseen hand was guiding him. The stage manager, having finished the drama and undressed the actor, shows him to us. Look at what you believed in. Here he is. Do you see now that it was not he but I who moved you? But blinded by the force of movement, people long fail to understand that. Still greater consistency and necessity are presented in the life of Alexander I, the figure who stood at the head of the counter-movement from east to west. What does that man need who overshadowing others who would stand at the head of this movement from east to west. He needs a sense of justice, a concern for the affairs of Europe, but a distant concern, unobscured by petty interests. He needs a moral superiority over his associates, the sovereigns of the time. He needs a mild and attractive personality. He needs a personal grievance against Napoleon, and all this is there in Alexander I. All this has been prepared by countless so-called chances throughout his past life, his upbringing, his liberal initiatives, the advisors surrounding him, Austerlitz, Tilsit, Erfurt. During the national war, this figure is inactive since he is not needed. But once the necessity for a general European war appears, this figure at a given moment appears in his place and uniting the people of Europe leads them to their goal. The goal is achieved. After the final war of 1815, Alexander finds himself at the height of all possible human power. How does he use it? Alexander I, the pacifier of Europe, a man who from his youth strove only for the good of his people, the first initiator of liberal innovations in his fatherland, now when he seems to possess the greatest power and therefore the possibility for doing good, of doing good for his people, while Napoleon is in exile, makes childish and deceitful plans for how he would make mankind happy if he had had power. Alexander I, having fulfilled his vocation and felt the hand of God upon him, suddenly recognizes the insignificance of this imaginary power, turns away from it, puts it into the hands of people he despises who are despicable, and says only, Not unto us, but unto, not unto us, not unto us, but unto thy name. I am also a man like you. Let me live like a man and think of my soul and of God. As the sun in every atom, of the ether is a sphere complete in itself and at the same time only an atom of a whole that is inaccessible to man in its enormity. So too every person bears his own purpose within himself and yet bears them in order to serve general purposes that are inaccessible to man. A bee sitting on a flower stung a child and the child is afraid of bees and says that a bee's purpose consists in stinging people. A poet admires a bee sucking from the cup of the flower and says that the bee's purpose consists in sucking up the fragrance of flowers. A beekeeper, noting how a bee gathers flower pollen and brings it to the hive, says that a bee's purpose consists in gathering honey. 
Another beekeeper who has studied the life of a hive more closely says that a bee collects pollen in order to feed the young bees and rear a queen, and that its purpose consists in reproducing its kind. A botanist notes that as a bee lands with pollen on a pistil of a dioecious flower, it fertilizes it, and in that, the botanist sees the bee's purpose. Another, observing the migration of plants, see that, sees that the bee contributes to that migration, and that this new observer says it it is th this, that is, the bee's purpose consists. But the final purpose of the bee is exhausted neither by one nor the other, nor the third purpose that human reason is able to discover. The higher human reason rises in discovery of these purposes, the more obvious it for it is the inaccessibility of the final purpose. All that is accessible to man is the observation of the correspondence between the life of the bee and other phenomena in life. It is the same for the purpose of historical figures and people. Section 5 The wedding of Natasha, who married Bazukov in the year 13, was the last joyful event in the family of the old Rostovs. Count Ilya Andreevich died that same year, and as always happens with his death, the whole the old family broke up. The events of the past year, the Moscow fire and the flight from it, the death of Prince Andrei and Natasha's despair, the death of Petya, the Countess's grief, all this, like one blow after another, fell on the old Count's head. It seemed he did not understand and felt unable to understand the significance of all these events and morally bowed his old head as if expecting and asking for new blows that would finish him off. He seemed now frightened and perplexed, now unnaturally animated and and Enter enterprising. Natasha's wedding occurred, occupied him for the sa some time. Natasha's wedding occupied him for some time by its external side. He ordered dinners, suppers, and obviously wanted to appear cheerful, but his cheerfulness did not communicate itself as formally, but on the contrary, evoked compassion in people who knew and loved him. After the departure of Pierre and his wife, he grew quiet and began to complain of anguish. A few days later, he fell ill and took to his bed. Despite the doctor's reassurances, he understood from the first days of his illness that he would not get up again. The countess spent two weeks in an armchair by his bedside without undressing. Each time she gave him his medication, he sobbed and silently kissed her hand. On the last day, weeping, he begged forgiveness of his wife and absent son for having ruined their property, the chief guilt he felt hanging over him. Having taken communion and been anointed, he died quietly, and the next day a crowd of acquaintances who came to pay their last respects to the deceased filled the Rostov's rented apartment. All these acquaintances, who had dined and danced so many times in his house, who had laughed at him so many times, now said the same feeling of, said with the same feeling of inner reproach and affection, as if justifying themselves before someone. Yes, be that as it may, he was an excellent man. You don't meet such men nowadays, and... Who doesn't have his weaknesses? Precisely at a time when the count, Count's affairs had been so entangled that it was impossible to imagine how it would all end if it went on a year longer, he unexpectedly died. Nikolai was with the Russian troops in Paris when the news of his father's de death reached him. He immediately sent in his resignation and, without waiting to be discharged, took a leave and went to Moscow. The state of their financial affairs became perfectly clear within a month after the Count's death, astonishing everyone by the enormity of the sum of various little debts, the existence of which no one even suspected. The debts were twice greater than the property itself. Relations and friends advised Nikolai to renounce the inheritance, but Nikolai saw renouncing the inheritance as an expression of reproach to his father's memory, which was sacred to him, and therefore could not hear of it, and accepted the inheritance with the obligation to pay off the debts. The creditors, who had been silent for so long, being bound while the Count was alive by that undefined but powerful influence with his, which his lax kindness had on them, suddenly all sued for recovery. There was, as always happens, a competition for who would get paid first, and those very people who, like Mitenka and others, held uncovered promissory notes as gifts, now turned out to be the most demanding creditors. Nikolai was given no time or respite, and those who, by the look of it, had felt sorry for the old man, who was to blame for their losses, if there were losses, now fell mercilessly on the young heir, obviously guiltless before them, who voluntarily took the payment upon himself. Not one of Nikolai's proposed schemes succeeded. The estate went 
under the hammer for half its value, and half of the debt still remain unpaid. Nikolai accepted the 30000 offered him by his brother-in-law Bazukov to pay off the portion of debts he recognized as real debts of money. And to avoid being sent to jail for the remaining debts as his creditor threatened, creditors threatened, he went into the service again. To go to the army, where he stood to get the first vacant post as a regimental commander, was impossible, because his mother now clung to her son as her last enticement to life, and therefore... Despite his reluctance to remain in Moscow in the circle of people who had known him formerly, despite his loathing for the civil service, he accepted a civil post in Moscow, and having taken off his beloved uniform, settled with his mother and Sonia in a small apartment on the Siv Sev Vrazhek. Natasha and Pierre were living in Petersburg at the time and had no clear idea of Nikolai's situation. Having borrowed money from his brother-in-law, Nikolai tried to conceal his disastrous situation from him. His situation was especially bad because not only had he, he not only had to support himself, Sonia, and his mother on his 1,200-ruble salary, but had to support his mother in such a way that she did not notice they were poor. The Countess could not understand the possibility of life without the conditions of luxury she had been accustomed to since childhood, and not realizing how difficult it was for her son, she demanded now a carriage they did not have to send for a lady acquaintance, now some expensive food for herself and wine for her son, now money so as to make a surprise gift to Natasha, Sonia, or Nikolai himself. Sonia ran the household, took care of her aunt, read aloud to her, put up with her caprices and secret dislike, and helped Nikolai to conceal from the old countess the situation of poverty in which they found themselves. Nikolai felt he owed an unrepayable debt of gratitude to Sonia for all she was doing for his mother, admired her patience and devotion, but tried to distance himself from her. In his heart, it was as if he reproached her for being too perfect and having nothing to be reproached for. In her, there was everything for which people are appreciated, but there was little of what would make him love her. And he felt that the more he appreciated her, the less he loved her. He took her at her word in the letter in which she had given him his freedom and behaved with her now as if all that had been between them was long forgotten and could by no means be repeated. Nikolai's situation was becoming worse and worse. The thought of putting a something aside from his salary proved a dream. He not only put nothing aside, but in satisfying his mother's demands, accumulated small debts. No way out of his situation presented itself to him. The thought of marrying a rich heiress, which his female relations suggested to him, he found revolting. The other way out of his situation, his mother's death, never entered his head. He wished for nothing, hoped for nothing, and deep in his heart took a gloomy and stern pleasure in the unmurmuring endurance of his situation. He tried to avoid former acquaintances with their condolences and offers of insulting assistance, avoided all distractions and amusements, and even at home did nothing except lay out patience with his mother, silently pace the room, and smoke pipe after pipe. It was as if he was carefully maintaining in himself that gloomy state of mind which alone enabled him to endure his situation. Section 6. At the beginning of, the w of winter, Princess Maria came to Moscow. From town rumors, she learned about the situation of the Rostovs and how, quote, the son was sacrificing himself for his mother, as they said in town. I never expected anything else of him, Princess Maria said to herself, feeling a joyful confirmation of her love for him. Remembering her friendly and almost familial relations with their family, she considered it her duty to visit them. But remembering her relations with Nikolai and Vorenz, she was afraid of it. Nevertheless, making a great effort with herself, several weeks after her arrival in town, she went to see the Rostovs. Nikolai was the first to meet her because one could get to the countess's room only through his. At his first glance at her, Nikolai's face, instead of the joy expression of joy that Princess Maria expected to see on it, assumed an expression of coldness, dryness, and pride such as the princess had never seen before. Nikolai asked about her health, took her to his mother, and having sat for about five minutes, left the room. When she left the countess, Nikolai met her again, and with a particularly so particular solemnity and dryness, saw her to the front hall. He did not say a word in reply to her remark about the countess's health. "'What's it to you? Leave me alone,' his gaze said. "'What's she prowling around for? What does she want? I can't bear these ladies and all the these gentilities,' he said aloud in Sonia's presence, evidently unable to hold back his vexation once the princess's carriage had driven away from the house." "'Ah, Nicholas, how can you say such things?' said Sonia, barely concealing her joy. "'She's so kind, and Maman loves her so.' Nikolai said nothing, and would have preferred not to talk about the princess any more, but since the day of her visit, the old countess began to talk about her several times a day. 
The countess praised her, demanded that her son call on her, expressed a wish to see her more often, but along with that always became ill-humored when she spoke of her. Nikolai tried to say nothing when his mother spoke of the princess, but his silence vexed the countess. She's a very worthy and wonderful girl, she said, and you must call on her. At least you'll see someone, because I think you're bored with us. But I don't have the slightest wish to, Mama. First you wanted to see her, and now I don't wish to. I really don't understand you, my dear. First you're bored, then you suddenly don't want to see anybody. I never said I was bored. Why, you always said you didn't wish... Why, you yourself said don't... You don't even wish to see her. She's a very worthy girl, and you always liked her, but now there are suddenly some sort of reasons. You hide everything from me. Not at all, Mama. If I w was asking you to go do something unpleasant, but all I'm asking is that you go and return a visit. It would seem the courtesy demands it. I've asked you, and now I won't interfere any more, since you have secrets from your mother. I'll go, then, if you want. It makes no difference to me. I want it for your sake. Nikolai sighed, bit his mustache, and laid out the cards, trying to divert his mother's attention to another subject. The next day, and the third and the fourth, the same conversation was repeated. After her visit to the Rostovs and the unexpected cold reception she was given by Nikolai, Princess Maria confessed to herself that she had been right in not wishing to go first to the Rostovs. I expected nothing else, she said to herself, calling on her pride for help. I don't care for him at all. I merely wanted to see the old lady who was always kind to me and to whom I owe a great deal but she could not pacify herself with these arguments. A feeling akin to repentance tormented her when she, vi when she re remembered her visit. Though she had firmly resolved not to call on the Rostovs anymore and to forget it all, she constantly felt herself in an uncertain position, and when she asked herself what it was that tormented her, she had to confess that it was her relations with Rostov. His cold, courteous tone did not come from his feeling for her. She knew that, but was covering up something. That's something she had to explain, and until then she felt she could not be at peace. In the middle of winter, she was sitting in the schoolroom, following her ne nephew's lessons, when Rostov's arrival was announced. Firmly resolved not to give away her secret and not to show her confusion, she called Madame Mademoiselle Bourrienne, and together with her came out to the drawing room. With the first glance at Nikolai's face, she saw that he had come only to fulfill his duty to courtesy, and she resolved to firmly keep firmly to the same tone in which he addressed her. They talked about the Countess's health, about mutual acquaintances, about the latest news of the war, and when ten minutes demanded by decency had passed, after which a guest may rise, Nikolai stood up to say goodbye. The princess, with the help of Mademoiselle Bourrien, had sustained the conversation very well, but at the last mo moment, just as he stood up, she felt so tired of talking about things of no concern to her, and the thought that she alone was given so few joys in life occupied her so much that in a fit of absent-mindedness her luminous eyes staring straight ahead she sat motionless not noticing that he had stood up nikolai looked at her wishing to make it seem that he did not notice her absent-mindedness said a few words to mademoiselle bohien and again glanced at the princess she was sitting just as motionless and her tender face expressed suffering he suddenly felt sorry for her and vaguely imagined that he might be the cause of the sorrow expressed on her face. He would have liked to help her to say something nice to her, but he could not think of what to say. Goodbye, princess, he said. She came to her senses, blushed, and sighed deeply. Ah, uh, forgive me, she said, as if waking up. You're leaving already, Count? Well, goodbye. What about the pillow for the Countess? Wait, I'll bring it at once, said Mademoiselle Bourrienne, and she left the room. They were both silent, glancing at each other from time to time. Yes, princess, Nikolai finally said, smiling sadly. It doesn't seem long ago, but so much water has flowed by since you and I first I met for the first time in Bogachevaro. How unfor unfortunate we all seemed. Yet I'd pay dearly to bring that time back, but there's no bringing it back. The princess was looking intently into his eyes with her luminous gaze while he said that. It was as if she were trying to grasp the hidden meaning of his words, which would explain to her his feelings for her. Yes, yes, she said. But you shouldn't regret the past, Count. As I understand your life now, you'll always remember it with pleasure because the self-sacrifice by which you live now. I will not accept your praises, he hastily interrupted her. On the contrary, I constantly reproach myself. That is a quite uninteresting and cheerless subject. And again his eyes acquired the, their former dry and cold expression. But the princess had already seen in him the same man she had known and loved, and she now spoke only with that man. I thought you would allow me to say that to you, she said. 
I had become so close to you and to your family, and I thought you would not consider my sympathy misplaced, but I was mistaken, she said. Her voice suddenly quavered. I don't know why, she went on, having composed herself. You were different before, and... There are thousands of reasons why. He placed special emphasis on the word why. Thank you, princess, he said softly. It's sometimes hard. So that's why, that's why, an inner voice was saying in Princess Mara's soul. No, it wasn't only that cheerful, kind, and open gaze. Not only that handsome appearance that I loved in him. I guessed at his noble, firm, self-sacrificing soul, she said to herself. Yes, he's poor now, and I'm rich. Yes, it's only because of that. Yes, if it weren't for that, and recalling his former tenderness, and looking now at his kind and sad face, she suddenly understood the reason for his coldness. But why, Count? Why? She almost, she suddenly almost cried out involuntarily, moving towards him. Why? Tell me. You must tell me. He was silent. I don't know your why, Count, she went on, but it's hard for me. It's... I'll confess it to you. You want for some reason to deprive me of your former friendship, and that pains me. There were tears in her eyes and in her voice. There has been so little happiness in my life that every loss is hard for me. Forgive me. Goodbye. She suddenly began to weep and started out of the room. Princess, wait, for God's sake, he cried, trying to stop her. Princess! She glanced back. For a few seconds, they looked into each other's eyes, and the distant and impossible suddenly became near, possible, and inevitable. Section 7 In the fall of 1814, Nikolai married Princess Maria and moved with his wife, mother, and Sonia to live at Bald Hills. In three years, without selling his wife's estate, he paid off the remaining debts and, having received a small inheritance from a deceased cousin, also paid back his debt to Pierre. Woohoo! In three more years, by 1820, Nikolai had so arranged his financial affairs that he bought another small estate near Bald Hills and was negotiating to buy back his father's Otredno, which was his fondest dream. Having begun farming out of necessity, he quickly developed such a passion for it that it became his favorite and almost sole occupation. Nikolai was a simple farmer, did not like innovations, especially the English ones, which were becoming fashionable then, laughed at theoretical writings on farming, did not like mill works, expensive products, expensive cereal crops, and generally was not taken up with any specific part of farming. Before his eyes, there was always only the estate as a whole, and not some part of it. And the chief thing on the estate was not nitrogen and not oxygen, which were in the soil or the air, not a special plow and manure, but the chief tool by means of which nitrogen and oxygen and manure and the plow became op operative, that is, the laboring muzhik. When Nikolai took up farming and began going into various parts, his attention was especially drawn to the muzhik. The muzhik appeared to him not only a tool, but as a goal and a judge. He began by studying the muzhik, trying to understand what he wanted, what he considered bad or good, and only pretended to give instructions and orders, but in essence was only learning the methods and speech of the muzhiks and their judgment of what was good and what was bad. And only when he understood the tastes and the striving of the muzhiks, learned to speak his language and understand the hidden meaning of his speech, when he felt akin to him, only then did he begin to boldly manage him, that is to fulfill in relation to the muzhiks that very duty, the fulfillment of which was demanded of him. And Nikolai's farming produced the most brilliant results. On taking up the, manage of the management of the estate, Nikolai at once, unerringly, by some gift of insight, appointed a, as bailiff, headman, and delegate, the very people who would have been chosen by the Mosiks themselves if it had been up to them, and his officers never changed. Before studying the chemical properties of manure, before getting involved with debt and credit, as he liked to say mockingly, he found out the number of cattle the peasants had and increased that number by every possible means. He maintains, maintained peasant families of the largest size, not allowing them to divide up. The lazy, the depraved, and the weak he persecuted equally and tried to drive them out of the community. During the sowing and harvesting of hay and grains, he looked after his own and the Musik's fields in exactly the same way. And rare was the landowner who had his field sown and harvested so early and so well and had such good returns as Nikolai. He did not like having anything to do with house serfs, called them freeloaders, and as everyone said, spoiled and indulged indulge, indulge them. And when some sort of order had to be given about a house serf, especially when one had to be punished, he would lapse into indecisiveness and consult everyone in the house. But when it was possible to send a house serf as a soldier in place of a muzhik, he did it without the slightest hesitation. In all his orders concerning muzhiks, he never experienced the slightest doubt. 
Any order from him, this he knew, would be approved by all against one or a few. He never allowed himself either to burden or punish a man only because he wanted it that way, or to relieve and reward a man because it was his personal desire to do so. He would have been unable to say what constituted this yardstick of what should and should not be done, but this yardstick in his soul was firm and unwavering. He often said with vexation of some failure or disorder, that's our Russian folk, and fancied that he could not bear muzhiks. But with all the forces of his soul, he loved these Russian folk and their way of life, and only because of that understood and adopted for himself the one way and method of farming that produced good results. Countess Mari was jealous of this love of her husband's and was sorry that she could not share in it, but she could not understand the joys and griefs afforded him by that separate world so foreign to her. She could not understand why he was so especially animated and happy when, having gotten up at dawn and spent the whole morning in the fields or at the threshing floor, he came back to have tea with her from the sowing, mowing, or harvesting. She did not understand why he told her admiringly and with rapture about the rich, thrifty muzhik Matve Ermishin, who spent whole nights with his family transporting sheaves and before anyone else had anything harvested, already had his stacks built. She did not understand why, pacing from come from the threshing hole, threshing floor, red, sunburnt and sweaty, with the smell of wormwood and bitter wart in his hair, joyfully rubbing his hands and say, well, one mortal day and mine and the peasants will, will all be threshed. Still less could she understand why he, with his kind heart, with his usual readiness to anticipate her wishes, could almost be driven to despair when she conveyed to him the request of some peasant woman or muzik who had turned to her instead of, turned to her asking to be released from work, why he, her kind Nicholas, stubbornly refused her, angrily asking her not to interfere in what was not her business. She felt that he had his special world, which he passionately loved, and with, with some sort of laws that she did not understand. When trying to understand him, she occasionally spoke to him of his merits, which consisted in being good to his subjects. He would get angry and say, Not in the least. It never enters my head, and I wouldn't do this much for their good. It's all poetry and old wives' tales. All this good of one's neighbor. I want our children not to go begging. I have to set up our fortune while I live, and that's all. What's needed for that is order, strictness. That's what, he said, clenching his sanguine fist. And justice, of course, he added. Because if a peasant is naked and hungry and has only one little nag, he won't work well, whether it's for himself or for me. And it must be have been because Nikolai did not allow himself the thought that he was doing anything for others out of virtuousness. All that he did was fruitful. His fortune quickly increased. The neighboring muzhiks came asking him to buy them, and long after his death, the pious memory of his management was preserved among the people. He was a master. The muzhiks' affairs first, then his own. But he never went easy on us. In short, a master. Section 8 The one thing that tormented Nikolai in his running of the estate was his hot temper, combined with the old hussar habit of making free with his fists. At first, he saw nothing reprehensible in it, but in the second year of his marriage, his view of this sort of reprisal suddenly changed. Once in the summer, the headman from Bogachevaro was summoned, the one who had replaced the late drawn and who was accused of various frauds and irregularities. Nikolai came out to, to him on the porch, and with the head headman's first answers, shouts and blows could be heard in the front hall. Returning home for lunch, Nikolai went up to his wife, who was sitting with her head bent low over her embroidery, and began telling her, as usual, everything he had been busy with that morning, and incidentally about the Bogachevaro headman. Countess Maria, turning red, then pale, and pursing her lips, sat in the same way her head bowed, and made no reply to her husband's words. Sunset impudent scoundrel,' he said, getting angry at the mere recollection. "'He could have told me he was drunk, didn't see—' "'What's wrong, Marie?' he suddenly asked. Countess Maria raised her head and was about to say something, then quickly looked down again and pressed her lips. What is it? What's wrong, my dearest? The homely Countess Maria always became prettier when she wept. She never wept from pain or vexation, but always from sadness and pity. And when she wept, her luminous eyes became irresistibly lovely. As soon as Nikolai took her hand, she was unable to restrain herself and began to weep. Nicholas, I saw he was wrong, but what you did, why did you... Nicholas, and she covered her face with her hands. Nicholas fell silent, blushed deeply, and moved away from her, silently began pacing the room. He understood what she was weeping about, but in his soul he could not suddenly agree with her that something he had lived with since childhood and considered almost or most ordinary was bad. 
Is this gentility's old wives' tales, or is she right? He asked himself. Without deciding the answer for himself, he glanced once again at her suffering and lovely face and suddenly understood that she was right, and he had long been in the wrong with himself. Marie, he said softly, going up to her, it will never happen again. I give you my word. Never, he repeated in, the, in a quavering voice, like a boy asking for forgiveness. The tears flowed still more abundantly from the countess's eyes. She took her husband's hand and kissed it. Nicholas, when did you break the cameo? She said to change the subject, studying his hand, on which there was a signet ring with the head of Lao Kun. Today, all the same thing. Ah, Marie, don't remind me of it. He blushed deeply again. I give you my word that it won't happen again, and let this always remind me of it, he said, pointing to the broken ring. From then on, in talking with headmen and stewards, the moment the blood rushed to his face and his hands began clenching in fists, Nikolai turned the broken ring on his finger and lowered his eyes before the man who had angered him. However, about twice a year he would forget himself and would then come to his wife, confess, and again promise her that this was now the very last time. Marie, surely you despise me, he would say to her. I deserve it. You should walk away. Walk away quickly if you feel you can't control yourself, Countess Maria would say with sadness, trying to comfort her husband. Among the gentry of the province, Nikolai was respected but not liked. He was not proud or he was not concerned with the interests of gentry. And for, the, that, some, uh, and for that, some regarded him as a proud, others as a stupid man. All his time in the summer, from the spring sowing to the harvest, was spent on farm work. In the fall, with the same business-like seriousness which he occupied himself with farming, he gave himself to hunting, going off for a month or two with his hunt. In winter, he rode around to his other estates and took up reading. His reading consisted mostly of history books, which he ordered each year for a certain sum. He was putting together, as he said, a serious library, and made it a rule to read all the books he, brought, he bought. He would sit in his study with an important look over this reading, which was first self-imposed as a duty but later became a habitual occupation that provided him with a special sort of pleasure and the awareness of being occupied with a serious matter. Except for business trips, he spent the greater part of the time in winter at home, sharing the life of his family and entering into the minute relations between mother and children. He became closer and closer with his wife, every day discovering new spiritual treasures in her. From the time of Nikolai's marriage, Sonia had been living in his house. Before his marriage, blaming himself and praising her, Nikolai had told his fiance everything that there had been between him and Sonia. He had asked Princess Mari to be gentle and kind with his cousin. Countess Maria felt the full guilt of her husband. She also felt her own guilt before Sonia. She thought that her fortune had influenced Nikolai's choice, but could not reproach Sonia for anything, wished to love her, but not only did not love her, but often found wicked feelings against her in her heart and could not overcome them. Once she got to talking with her friend Natasha about Sonia and about her unfairness towards her. You know what, said, Ta said Natasha, You've read the Gospels a great deal. There's a passage in them that's exactly about Sonia. What? Countess Mari asked in astonishment. To him who has, to has will be given, but from him who has not will be taken. Remember? She's the one who has not. Why? I don't know. Maybe she lacks egoism. I don't know. But from her will be taken, and everything has been taken. I feel terribly sorry for her sometimes. I used to want terribly for Nicholas to marry her, but I always had a sort of presentiment that it would never be. She's a sterile blossom, you know, like on strawberries. Sometimes I feel sorry for her, but sometimes I think she doesn't feel it the way we would. And though Countess Maria explained to Natasha that those words of the gospel should be understood differently, looking at Sonia, she agreed with the explanation given by Natasha. Indeed, it did seem that Sonia was not burdened by her position and was completely reconciled with her destiny as a sterile blossom. It seemed she valued not so much the people as the whole family. Like a cat, she became accustomed not to the people, but to the house. She took care of the old countess, petted and pampered the children, was always ready to render the small services she was capable of, but all this was involuntarily taken, for, taken with far too little gratitude. The country seat at Bald Hills had been rebuilt, but no longer on the footing it had been under the late prince. The buildings, begun in the lean time, were still were more than simple. 
The enormous house on the old stone foundations was built of wood and plastered only inside. The big roomy house with its bare plank floors was furnished with the simplest hard sofas and armchairs, tables and chairs, fashioned from their own birches by their own joiners. The house was spacious with rooms for the servants and separate quarters for visitors. The relations of the Rostovs and the Bolkonskis sometimes descended on bald hills by whole families with their 16 horses with dozens of servants and stayed for months. Besides that, four times a year on the master's birthdays, ber master's birthdays and name days, up to a hundred guests would gather for a day or two. For the rest of the year, an inviolably regular life went on with its usual occupations, teas, lunches, dinners, and suppers from the household's provisions. Section 9 it was the eve of the winter feast of St. Nicholas, the 5th of December, 1820. That year, Natasha, her children, and husband had been visiting with her brother since the Natasha, her children, and husband had been on his own special business, as he put it, for three weeks, and had already stayed for seven. He was expected any moment. On the 5th of December, besides the Bazukov family, Nikolai's old friend, retired General Vasily Fyodorovich Denisov also visited the Rostovs. On the 6th, the feast day, when guests would gather, Nikolai knew he would have to take off his quilted jacket, put on a frock coat and narrow boots with narrow toes, and go to the new church he had built, and then receive congratulations, serve refreshments, and talk about the election of the Marshal of Nobility and about the harvest. But he still considered it his right to spend the eve of the day as usual. Before dinner, Nikolai went through the bailiff's accounts from the Ryazen village, the estate of his wife's nephew, wrote two business letters, and strolled to the threshing floor, the cattle, and horse yards. Having taken measures against the general drunkenness expected the next day on the occasion of the patron saint's feast, he came to dinner, and having no time for a private talk with his wife, sat down at the long table set for twenty, at which the whole household was gathered. At the table were his mother, uh, the old Mrs. Belov, who lived with her, his wife, his three children, the governess, the tutor, his nephew with his tutor, Sonia, Denisov, Natasha, her three children, their governess, and old Mikhail Ivanich, the prince's architect, who was living in retirement at Bald Hills. Countess Maria sat at the opposite end of the table. As soon as her husband sat in his place by the gesture with which, having removed the napkin, he quickly shifted the goblet and wine glass that stood in front of him, Countess Maria decided that he was in a bad humor as sometimes happened to him, and especially before the soup, and when he had come to dinner straight from farm work. Countess Maria knew the, that mood very well, and when she was in a good mood herself, she calmly waited until he had had his soup, and only then began to talk to him and make him admit that he was in a bad humor for no reason. But to tell you, she completely forgot this observation of hers. It pained her that he was angry with her for no reason, and she felt unhappy. She asked him where he had been. He told her. She also asked how, whether everything was all right on the farm. He winced unpleasantly from her unnatural tone and answered brusquely. So I wasn't mistaken, thought Countess Mario. Why is he angry with me? In the tone of his answer, Countess Mario heard ill will towards her and a wish to break off the conversation. She felt that her words were unnatural, but she could not keep from asking several more questions. Thanks to Denisov, the conversation at dinner soon became general and lively, and Countess Mario did not talk to her husband. When they left the table and went to thank the old countess, Countess Maria kissed her husband, holding out her hand, and asked him why he was angry with her. "'You always have the strangest notions. I've never thought of being angry,' he said. But the word always answered Countess Maria. "'Yes, I'm angry, and I don't want to say so.' Nikolai and his wife got along so well that even Sonia and the old countess, who out of jealousy wished for some disagreement between them, could find no pretext for reproach. But there were also moments of hostility between them. Sometimes, precisely after the happiest periods, a feeling of estrangement and hostility suddenly came over them. This feeling appeared most often at the time of Countess Maria's pregnancies. She was in one of those periods now. Well, messieurs and madames, Nikolai said loudly, and as if merrily, Countess Maria fancied it was deliberate so as to offend her. I've been on my feet since six o'clock. Tomorrow I'll have to suffer, but today I'll go and rest. Without saying anything more to Countess Maria, he went to the small sitting room and lay on the sofa. That's how it always is, thought Countess Maria. He talks with everybody except me. I see, I see, he finds me repulsive, especially in this condition. 
She looked at her high stomach and in the mirror at her yellow, pale, emaciated face, its eye, big eyes bigger than ever. And everyone became, and everything became unpleasant for her. Denisov's shouting and laughing and Natasha's talking, and especially the glance that Sonia cast at her. Sonia was always the first pretext that Countess Maria chose for her irritation. Having sat with the... Sonia was always the first pretext that Countess Mara chose for her irritation. Having sat with the guests and understood nothing of what they were saying, she quietly stepped out and went to the nursery. The children were riding to Moscow on chairs and invited her to come with them. She sat down and played with them, but the thought of her husband and his groundless vexation never stopped tormenting her. She got up and, tiptoeing with difficulty, went to the small sitting room. Maybe he's not asleep. I'll have a talk with him, she said to herself. Andrushka, the elder boy, imitating her, came after her on tiptoe. Countess Mari did not notice him. Chari Marie, il dort, je crois, il est si fatigue, said Sonia. Dear Marie, he's sleeping, I think. He's so tired. It seemed to Countess Mari that she met her everywhere, said Sonia. It seemed to Countess Mari that she met her everywhere. In the big sitting room, Andrushka may wake him up. Countess Mari turned, saw Andrushka behind her, felt that Sonia was right, and precisely because of that, flared up and clearly had difficulty holding back a harsh word. She said nothing, and so as not to obey Sonia, made a sign with her hand that for, for Andrushka not to make a noise but still follow her, and went to the door. Sonia left by the other door. From the room where Nikolai was sleeping, his wife could hear his regular breathing, familiar to her, down to the smallest nuance. Hearing that breathing, she saw before her his smooth, handsome forehead, his mustache, his whole face, which she so often gazed at for a long time while he slept in the silence of the night. Nikolai suddenly stirred and grunted. At the same time, Andrushka shouted something through the door. Papa, Mama, standing here! Countess Maria turned pale from fright and began making signs to her son. He fell silent, and this silence, so terrible for Countess Maria, went on for about a minute. She knew how much Nikolai disliked being awakened. Suddenly, from behind the door, a new grunt movement and the displeased voice of Nikolai said, They don't give me a moment's peace. Marie, is that you? Why have you brought him here? I only came to look. I didn't see... Excuse me. Nikolai cleared his throat and fell silent. Countess Maria stepped away from the door and took her son to the nursery. Five minutes later, unnoticed by her mother, the three-year-old, dark-eyed little Natasha, her father's favorite, having learned from her brother that Papa was sleeping in Mama's sitting room, ran to her father. The dark-eyed little girl boldly opened the creak creaking door, went up to the sofa, stepped energetically on stepping energetically on her blunt little feet and making out the position of her father who was sleeping with his back to her, got up on tiptoe and kissed his hand, which lay under his head. Nikolai turned with a tender smile on his face. Natasha, Natasha, Countess Maria's frightened whisper was heard through the door. Papa wants to sleep. No, Mama, he doesn't want to sleep, little Natasha answered with conviction. He's laughing. Nikolai lowered his feet, sat up, and took his daughters in his arm. Come in, Masha, he said to his wife. Countess Maria went in and sat down by her husband. I didn't see him run after me, she said timidly. I'm so... Nikolai, holding his daughter with one arm, glanced at his wife and, noticing the guilty expression on her face, put his arm around her and kissed her on the hair. May I kiss Mama? Wait, sorry. <laughs> May I kiss Mama? He asked Natasha. Natasha smiled shyly. Again, she said, pointing with an imperious gesture to the place where Nat Nikolai had kissed his wife. I don't know why you think I'm in a bad humor, said Nikolai, answering the question that he knew was in his wife's mind. You can't imagine how unhappy and lonely I am when you're like that. It always seems to me. Enough, silliness, Marie. Shame on you, he said gaily. It seems to me that you can't love me because I'm so plain. Always. And now, in this condition. Ah, oh, how funny you are. Not dear for being pretty, but pretty for being dear. Men only love Malvina and the like because they're beautiful. But do I love my wife? It's not love, but just, I don't know how to tell you. Without you or li like today, when there's some falling out between us, it's as if I'm lost and can't do anything. Well, do I love my finger? I don't love it, but try cutting it off. No, I'm not like that, but I understand. So you're not angry with me? Terribly angry, he said, smiling, and standing up and smoothing his hair, started pacing the room. Do you know what I was thinking about, Marie? He began. Now that they were reconciled, beginning at once to think aloud in his wife's presence, he did not ask whether she was prepared to listen to him. It made no difference to him. The thought had occurred to him, which meant to her, too. And he stood at her, and he told her of his intention 
to persuade Pierre to stay with them until spring. Countess Mari heard him out, made her comments, and in turn began to think her thoughts aloud. Her thoughts were about the children. How one sees the woman in her even now. Uh, how one sees the woman in her even now, she said in French, pointing to Natasha. You reproach us women for being illogical. Here's our logic. I say to her, Papa wants to sleep, and she says, no, he's laughing. And she's right, said Countess Maria, smiling happily. Yes, yes, and Nikolai, taking his daughter in his strong hands, lifted her up, seated her on his shoulders, and holding her legs, began walking about the room with her. Both father and daughter had the same senselessly happy faces. But you know, maybe you're unfair. You love this one too much, Countess Maria whispered in French. Yes, but what can I do? I try not to show it. Just then, the sounds of the door pulley and footsteps came from the front hall and anteroom, like the sounds of an arrival. Someone's here. I'm certain it's Pierre. I'll go and find out, said Countess Maria, and she went out of the room. In her absence, Nikolai allowed himself to give his daughter a gallop around the room. Out of breath, he quickly set down the laughing girl and hugged her to his breast. His leaps reminded him of, a, of dancing, and looking at the child's round, happy face, he thought of how she would be when he, as an old man, started taking her out and would do the mazurka with her, as his late father used to dance the Daniel Cooper with his daughter. "'It's him! It's him, Nicholas!' Countess Maria said a few minutes later, coming back into the room. Now our Natasha's revived. You you have you should have seen her delight, and how he's got it from how he got it from her for overstaying. Well, come along, come along quickly. Do part finally, she said, smiling, looking at the little girl who had pressed herself to her father. Nikolai went out, holding his daughter by the hand. Countess Maria stayed in the sitting room. Never, never would I have believed, she whispered to herself, that one could be so happy. Her face shone with a smile, but at the same time she sighed, and her profound gaze showed a little quiet sadness, as if besides the happiness she experienced, there was another happiness, unattainable in life, which she involuntarily remembered at this moment. Ah, which she involuntarily remembered at this moment. And there we go. And that is the end of the section for today. Like I said, a bit long, but I thought very satisfying. A good mixture of Tolstoy's usual um, perceptive, uh, sort of sharp observations uh, about history and about pers and historical persons, which I found particularly his observations about the history of Napoleon. I found particularly to particularly resonate with, uh, I don't know, the world today. There's a lot that seems very deja vu familiar from our current situations in the world. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to finally have some good like resolution for our characters. I know it's silly, but I'm so happy that Nikolai and Mario worked it out and Natasha and Pierre worked it out and they're all having kids and being happy and he's settling all the estates and everything. It's so good of him to work all that out for his family. And I'm so happy. And see, I kind of like, again, like people want to feel bad for Sonia and I do kind of, and I do kind of feel bad for Sonia, but I feel like princess Maria and Nikolai just work better together. You know, like just because Sonia loves him doesn't mean that that's going to be the best marriage. You know, like, can't be totally one-sided like that. It's like when people are like, but I love you. I would catch a grenade for you. Well, okay, but I have to be willing to catch a grenade for you too for this to work. <laughs> uh, silly example, but yeah, I just feel like they're a better match for each other. And they definitely, there's something about the way they click that they, um, I don't know, complement each other better. So yay, I'm happy. All right, folks, I won't keep you too long. Uh, we'll have, like I said, we're finishing the book this week. So buckle in. It's going to be great. Have a great rest of your Monday. I hope you're having a great day. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Stay safe. Stay well. Stay good. <laughs>